Hello, my name is Jim Forbes, and I'm here to talk about how our government's been broken and how we can fix it. The basic problem is that Congress is addicted to campaign money, big campaign money. Now, not every member of Congress, but most of them. And this addiction is just so overwhelming. The money is so overwhelming to Congress that it affects everything that they decide. Interestingly, Congress didn't bring this addiction on itself. It was thrust on Congress by the Supreme Court in a couple of decisions, but we can fix it. We can fix the problem. The problem is not what the Supreme Court has decided is illegal. It's what five members have decided is legal. There are four damaging rules that those five members have come up with. And they come out of two cases, basically, Buckley versus Vallejo and Citizens United that reaffirmed Buckley. The first bad rule is that there can be no limit on how much someone running for Congress can spend on their election. Now, that's just going to price good people out of the market. They can't afford to run for Congress. So it's not what the founders of the Constitution intended. The second bad rule is that money is the same as free speech. It gets the same protection as free speech. And if it's done the way the Supreme Court wants it done, it doesn't matter how big the money is. And that's not what the founders intended either. Money is property. Money is not speech. The third decision that they made is they, they decided to change the definition of corruption from what previous Supreme Courts had used. And the definition that they now use makes it nearly impossible to enact meaningful laws against the abuse of money in politics. Then the fourth decision is this business about corporations and labor unions have the same right as individual people to make campaign donations. And now wait a minute. Corporations are not people. They're not born, they don't die, and they don't get to vote. So why should we, um, why should we give them the same right as natural people to influence elections? Well, whatever the rationale, that's what the Supreme Court has decided. And that means that corporations can give unlimited amounts to elections for Congress or on ballot measures or even elections for judges. And heaven help us if judges get as money addicted as Congress. Elections these days depend on big money instead of depending on we the people. The founders of the Constitution set up a republic that's a representative democracy where the lawmakers are elected by we the people, and then they're supposed to represent nobody else. They're not supposed to have anybody else's interests in mind. But unfortunately, that republic has been lost. And as Harvard professor Lessig illustrates in this, in this classic photo, there's a barricade of money in front of the Capitol building. You can't get through. Ordinary people can't get through to get business done. Well, don't get me wrong about money. You know, in the right places, you can build schools, hospitals, the interstate highway system. Uh, we've built the internet with financial investments and the more traditional companies that our economy relies on. But when you put too much money in the wrong place, it's corrupting. If you give too much money to Congress, it's going to distort things. Now, look what happened. After Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, at that time it cost about $50,000 to run for Congress. But that case took the cap off, took the limit off how much you could spend. So every election cycle, the number just went up and up and up. There was more and more and more pressure to raise more money. By 2010, the number was $1.2 million. And then after Citizens United, it went up by half a million dollars in just two years. Nine out of 10 times a candidate with the most money wins the election. And it's not hard to see why. If you got more money, you got a better sound system. You can buy more TV ads. This person over here, the ordinary person, doesn't really have a chance. So more money equals more victories. And the Citizens United case just dumped unlimited money into the middle of our political system. Here's what it did. All through the 70s and 80s and 90s and early 2000s, the amount of independent expenditures in our campaigns was just about flat, down around zero. And then Citizens United got decided, and look what happens to the amount of independent money in our campaigns. It's just going through the roof. It's out of control. So if you want to win your election, you got to raise more money 
than your opponent. And what that means in this era of $1.7 million elections, and that number is just going up, by the way, it means that a House member, a candidate, has to raise $2,328 every single day of the year. That's weekends and holidays, and then the day after they get reelected, they got to go back out and raise it again. It's even worse in the Senate, where they have to raise $8,700 every single day of the year. Do you think they can raise that kind of money every day from just ordinary people? No, we don't have that kind of money. So what they do is they turn to the ultra-rich. And it takes a lot less time to raise big money from very wealthy people because you can raise big chunks at a time, right? They play this big money game in Washington, and it goes like this. you got a politician on one side, and you've got a client over here, a client of the lobbyist in the middle. And I'll just call that person the corporation. And then you got the lobbyist in the middle. And the politician and the lobbyist uh, both want something. The corporation wants something, too. The politician wants money to get reelected. The lobbyist wants a benefit for the corporate client. So the lobbyist lobbies the politician, and they're schmoozing, and there are parties, and there are trips to you know, skyboxes at football games. And more often than we would like, the politician will vote a benefit to the corporation. It could be a tax loophole, it could be a grant, it could be a uh, lucrative contract, but whatever it is, it comes out of taxpayer money. See, it, the politician isn't spending the politician's own money, it's taxpayer money. And then sometime, nobody knows when, it might even be before the vote, uh, might be after the vote, but sometime, the corporation is going to pay a, comp, a direct campaign contribution back to the politician. Now, keep this in mind. The contribution that the corporation pays is far less money than what the politician gave away out of the public treasury. How can that be legal? Well, the Supreme Court says it is. The Supreme Court changed the definition of corruption to what's called quid pro quo corruption. You've got to prove this for that. Quid pro quo means this for that. What you got to prove is that this politician agreed with that corporation to vote this benefit in exchange for that campaign contribution. And it's got to be exact. It's got to be this vote for that contribution. But see, with the lobbyist in the middle brokering the deal, you'll never have proof of quid pro quo corruption. So we can't stop it. The Supreme Court says, if you can't prove that it's quid pro quo corruption, it's just a campaign contribution. It's protected by the First Amendment. It's time to end that money game. Now, why will getting the money out work? I get asked that question sometimes. Well, because of this. Congress, as I noted, is just inundated, surrounded by big money. It influences everything. So whatever issue you want to solve, it could be any of these important issues. Let's just take tax reform, because a lot of people agree that the tax code is, is broken and it needs to be fixed. Whatever issue it is that you want to solve, there's somebody in Washington with a lot of money that doesn't want it solved. They prefer the status quo because it benefits them. So we've got to solve the money problem first. That's got to be our first priority. And then we can turn to the other issues. Get the money out first, then solve the other important and very important issues of the day. I want to give you an example about uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it could just as easily be about the Wall Street um, or the petroleum industry or the insurance lobby or any number of other sectors that engage in playing this big money game. But this one's about pharmaceuticals and it has to do with Medicare Part D. Remember that there is no prescription drug benefit before 2003, so Congress set out to uh, adopt one. And during the time that Congress was deciding Medicare Part D, pharma, that's the highest, one of the highest spending lobbies in Washington. That's the lobby for the pharmaceutical industry. They had 824 lobbyists on Capitol Hill. They spent $239 million lobbying that's a lot, of, a lot of parties, that's a lot of football games, that's a lot of golf junkets. They spent $87 million on campaign contributions, that's a lot of arm twisting. 
The total they spent is $326 million. And what did they get in return? What they got is a law. Congress passed this law that says that Medicare, part of government, may not use its purchasing power to negotiate lower prices from drug companies. You might think, huh? Congress is telling our own government not to get a better deal on behalf of the taxpayers? That's what they said, and here's what it means. We know what it means because the Veterans Administration, the DVA, now it's called, also buys a lot of prescription drugs. And let's just take the same pill. Let's just say this is a cholesterol medication. It's exactly the same brand. Every time Medicare buys that drug, it's got to pay a dollar. But every time the VA buys that pill, it pays 54 cents. The difference is that Medicare um, Medicare cannot negotiate the price, but the VA can negotiate. They're not shackled by Congress. The VA was set up in 1933, before this wave of big money, and before pharma had that kind of influence. What it means in total is that every year, according to the Congressional Budget Office, we overpay the pharmaceutical industry $11,200,000,000. That's money that comes from the taxpayers to the pharmaceutical industry. Can't we sue those guys? Well, basically we've already lost that case, so no, that's not the answer. Now, unfortunately, there's another side of the big money problem, and that's this revolving door that you may have heard about. This is where people in Washington go out into the private sector. Uh, they may go to Wall Street, or they may go to K Street and become lobbyists. And I want to give you an example of what this looks like, how it works. This is Billy Tauzin. Billy Tauzin was in Congress when Medicare Part D uh, was adopted, and he was the chair of a very powerful committee. He's given credit with pushing Part D through with that non-negotiate provision. And everybody in Congress knew that that was going to mean a lot more money for the pharmaceutical industry. So I don't know exactly what he was thinking at the time he was pushing through the non-negotiate clause, but I do know what he did next. And what he did next is here he is three months after, that's Billy Tauzin right there, three months after Part D became law, he shows up again as the president of Pharma, the very lobby that he just conferred this enormous benefit on. And he's getting paid $2 million a year. Okay, that's so common in Washington that they've got a pet phrase for it. It's called monetizing your government service. And monetizing is serious money. Whatever your position in government, you can make 10 times as much as a lobbyist. If you're making 200000 as a senator, you can make $2 million your first year as a lobbyist. So, politicians do it more and more and more. Right now, 42% of former House members are lobbyists. In the Senate, it's 50%. How do we know that this is a result of big money and not something else? We know that because in 1970, before the big money boom, only 3% of former congressional members became lobbyists, only 3%. What does this monetized thing mean for the rest of us, for we the people? Well, what it means is that during the years that these people are sitting in Congress and thinking about becoming lobbyists, are they thinking about we the people? Are they thinking about our best interests when they decide how to vote? Or are they thinking, well, wait a minute now, lobbying pays a lot of money, and if I get that job, I've got to, I've got to please the funders, because they're the ones that will decide you know, whether I get the job. So are they thinking people first, or are they thinking funders first? Even just subconsciously, they're thinking funders first, and their record shows it. Is this what the founders of the Constitution intended? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. They told us what they intended. They wrote these Federalist Papers at the time that they drafted the Constitution. And they explained in the papers what they meant in the Constitution. James Madison said that Congress ought to be dependent on the people alone, and it should have an intimate sympathy with the people alone. No divided loyalties. So. Is Congress dependent on the people alone, or do they depend on the big money funders? Are they in sympathy with the people alone? No, they're not. What it means is that we've got a system problem. The system is corrupted by money. Only this time, 
the system isn't your computer system, it's our constitution. So we've got a system-wide problem. It affects Republicans and Democrats. It needs a system-wide fix. Now, the Republicans and Democrats fight and fight and fight over many issues. But when it comes to the big money in politics, they're the same. They're both scarfing down as much of that big campaign money as they can. You might as well just call them the funding party because there's no difference. So what we need is a constitutional amendment that provides for the separation of money and the state. Remember this money circle? What if we could make this campaign donation illegal or even just put meaningful regulations on it? If that campaign donation did not happen, then this benefit from the politician to the big funder won't happen either. Why? Because the politicians won't be depending on the big corporations for money to get reelected. They'll be depending on us, the voters, to get reelected because we got the votes. So we can break that money circle. So what do we do about these Supreme Court decisions to break the money circle? Well, we got Buckley and Citizens United. What we do is we reverse them. We overturn those decisions. And you don't need a vote on the Supreme Court in order to do that because we've got Article 5 of the Constitution. The framers were smart enough and forward-looking enough to know that sometimes the Constitution would need to be amended. And so they gave us two ways to do it. The first way is through Congress. If two-thirds of both houses agree on an amendment and it's ratified by three-quarters of the states, then we got a constitutional amendment. But it's not going to happen that way. Because we can't get two-thirds of Congress to agree to anything except maybe when to take their next recess. And we're absolutely not going to get them to agree to get rid of the money that they become addicted to. So fortunately, there's a second way. Because the framers of the Constitution knew that sometimes Congress would be the problem. And so if two-thirds of the state legislatures call for a convention, then a convention will be held. There will be people from all 50 states there. And if three-quarters of the states ratify whatever amendment they come up with at that convention, then we've got an amendment. The states can do it. Look at this. 16 states are already on record calling for the overturn of Citizens United. If we can get 34 states to call for a constitutional convention, we'll have a convention. It'll be limited to this issue of money and politics. And for your part, you don't need to walk around in the streets carrying a placard, chanting slogans, anything like that. This is a, this is a much easier deal. All you need to do is call up your state representative, not, not your congressional, in, not the one in Washington, the one in your state capitol, and just say, tell the person that answers the phone, just say, I support an Article 5 convention to overturn Citizens United. It's just that simple. Because what's going to happen is they're going to listen to you. They'll write down your name and address, and then they'll report to their boss, that's your state representative, that there's another call in favor of this Article 5 convention to overturn Citizens United. And that means something. That means something to those people in the state house. We can get the government back for we, the people. We'll get our republic restored. We can get that facade, that barricade of money, away from Congress. We'll have a convention of the states. They'll write our constitutional amendment and get our government back. And that's how we solve this problem. Okay? Thank you.